Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Crystal. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is January 5th, 2012. Um, And I, just to preface this, I have a sponsor. She has 30 years sober. She has a sponsor. has more time than that. Um, And I have a home group. And I've sponsored other women. And I just kind of, this is how I live. Um, So... What I've always been told is I'm supposed to say what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, And kind of a synopsis would be, I am the fourth of six kids. I was born at Martin Army Hospital in Fort Benning, Georgia. My dad was in the military. He joined the Army to pay for medical school, so he's a doctor. My mom was a nurse, um, and I have two older brothers, an older sister, and two younger brothers. And I was a very painfully, painfully shy little kid, Um, like super painfully shy. I I remember as like maybe a three-year-old, my dad used to try and get me to go talk to the the waitress at restaurants, like, go ask her for some more napkins. And I would just freak out and like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to talk to her. She's a stranger. And like things like that for me were just punishing. They were really difficult. Um, and I think in that sense, I was an anomaly. My parents are both extroverts. I think all my siblings probably are too. Everybody else seemed much more comfortable with stuff like that. And I was always really scared. There's a picture of me from when I was like, probably around the same age, three or something, at a children's church, and they took pictures of all the little kids in their church outfits, and everyone else was smiling and cute, and I was bawling, crying, because I didn't want to be anywhere away from my mom. Um, So that was pretty much my disposition early on, and I think a lot of that, the reason I share it is because I think a lot of that stuff set me up for what came later on in my life. Um... When I was about six or seven, that's the period of time that I like to call something else. I'm not going to call it that tonight because I've been told I'm not supposed to cuss. But uh, (laughs) it's when everything kind of started falling apart. There was a lot of stuff that started happening um, all kind of around the same time. And my memory's not that great, so it gets jumbled together. But to give you the short list, my grandfather died. My dad went to rehab for substance abuse at Ridgeview. Actually, um, he was abusing the sample medications that they were giving him. And so he was gone for like three months. Um, my parents were getting divorced. My mom like surprised my dad with divorce papers on Valentine's. And then that led to, that was just the beginning, I think of like a three year long divorce for them, custody battle, all of that stuff, and also kind of the beginning of her descent into psychosis. My mom has a major mental illness. So just all of that together made for a really rough childhood, as you can imagine. Um, My experience with alcohol was relatively limited up until that point, just I think my dad would maybe give us sips here and there, but around the time I was six or seven was the first time I got drunk. Um, They used to let us have a half a glass of champagne at, on new year's. And so we did. And I went back for more. And I think I probably went back for more a couple of times, maybe two or three times and was definitely drunk. Um, And I went with my mom to go pick up my brother at a friend's house that night. And, um, I remember laying on the lawn at this kid's house and like, mom, I'm drunk. And she was like, no, you're not. Shush. And I was definitely, definitely drunk. I mean, you know, I remember it some, but I just remember feeling woozy and that was not the last time I'd feel that. Um, so I was a pretty good kid overall, um, kind of kept to myself and, um, (laughs) shut up, (laughs) I told my story once, and I said I played with myself a lot, and I meant I played by myself a lot. (laughs) 
<laughs> I played by myself a lot uh, when I was a kid. <laughs> I always felt like... <laughs> I, <laughs> I always felt like I was just different from my siblings, even though there were a lot of us. And I don't know if that was just a me thing or like if I created that sensation for myself and if I had just like applied myself, they would have accepted me. But I just always felt very different. Um, and that was a theme throughout my life, really, up until I got sober, basically, and even sometimes after. Um so I really didn't drink much after that, actually at all. The next time I drank was in high school, um, and that was kind of another period of chaos. Really, my entire life as a kid was chaos. My parents, after the whole dragging us through this terrible divorce and stuff, my mom finally, after about three years, really did have a psychotic break and finally was hospitalized and put on medication and it was like a switch was flipped and everything was fine again and we were a happy family again. And I wasn't part of that happy family. I was mad. I was really, really angry. Um, but that was just kind of the way that my family dealt with things. Like, okay, we're done now. We're not going to talk about it anymore. It's done. Um, everything's perfect again. And there was something in me that did not sit right with pretending like that whole entire experience didn't happen and not bringing it up. Um, so around the time I was 16, like I said, I was a good kid. I was a really good student. Um, I was an athlete. I worked really hard. I was very self-motivated and alcohol came into my life again around that time. Um, I, for the first time skipped school with some friends and had, I think, one smeared off ice over the course of three hours and was terrified I was going to get drunk, and I didn't. But I had fun with friends, and I was included, and I was part of. And from then on, over the weekends and things like that, we would go out for margaritas with the fake ID I somehow found. Thank you, Kimmy Faith. Um, <laughs> and we would smoke pot and just do whatever kids do. And I felt like I was a part of a group finally, even though I had been on sports teams and in clubs and all this other stuff growing up, I never felt like I was actually part of whatever it was that I was doing. I always felt like everyone just felt sorry for me. So they let me be there with them. And, um, so once I started drinking, it wasn't like it went downhill like that, but I'm relatively young, so it didn't take too long. Um, but I do notice looking back that a lot of the, the self-motivation and high achieving perfectionism kind of started drifting away. And in a way that was good because I used to kill myself over, not literally, but over, you know, grades and things like that, I was very, very hard on myself. So alcohol let me be not perfect and be okay with it. But it also helped me drive my life into the toilet at the same time. Um, just to give you guys, I guess, an example, I went to Catholic school. And I remember in like eighth grade, we had to do a monologue of um, Judas betraying Jesus, we had to like get up there and you know, acted out. And so I wrapped myself in a sheet and I got up there and I gave a heartfelt soliloquy and I got a 95 and in our grade or in our school, 96 and above was an A and I got it a minus or a, a instead of an A plus or something like that. And I went up to the teacher and was like, um, why did I get an A and not an A plus? And she was like, it's fine. It was good. You did fine. And I was like, no, it's not good enough. Like, <laughs> It was the way that my brain worked. It was ridiculous. <laughs> I would beat myself up over the silliest things. And looking back, I'm like, did I re do I really care if I can play a good Judas? No. But at the time, it was very important to me. And so alcohol and drugs and I guess just the feeling of not caring helped me get rid of some of that anxiety. Um, around the same time, I started developing really bad migraines. And I've been told I can share about drugs in this group, so I will. Um, I had really, really bad migraines and I want to read something before I talk about this from the big book. This is something that when I was first getting sober, really, really, really spoke to me. This is from the chapter acceptance was the answer. Um, and it's on page 411. 
the doctor in the story says, I wasn't able to quit chemicals as long as they were in the house. If they were around, I always found a need for them, especially the pills. I never in my life took a tranquilizer, sedative, or pet pill because I was a pill head. I always took it because I had the symptom that only that pill would relieve. Therefore, every pill was medically indicated at the time it was taken. For me, pills don't produce the desire to swallow a pill. They produce the symptoms that require that the pill be taken for relief. And in retrospect, I can look at my life and see that's exactly what happened. I think all of the chaos and all of the drama and all of the anxiety that I was experiencing manifested as migraines. And I had these terrible, debilitating migraines. The first one I ever got when I was 16 lasted a week and it was awful. And my dad had seen his mom have migraines his entire childhood and being the good doctor that he is and being somewhat one of us, not a self-proclaimed one of us, but thinking the way that we do, I'll say he wanted to help. And the best way that he could was by helping me get pain medicine. And I loved it. It was fantastic. All my cares went away. Um, and you know, I won't dwell too much on that, but I worked with him in his urgent care for a long time and, you know, started at UGA, um, did a lot of different, let me back up a little bit. So right before I went to college, I got into UGA right before I left the week before I had my wisdom teeth taken out and on the same day, cause I was terrified of needles. I had, um, you know, I had Valium for the surgery and I had a mole removed cause I knew I'd have Valium in my system and I wanted to get it taken care of and I was freaked out. So they did that. Um, the short version is I had terrible complications with my wisdom teeth, couldn't open my mouth for like two months, could barely fit a spoon in my mouth and had a lot of pain. They gave me a ton of pain medicine for that and told me to take it. So I did. Um, cause I'm a really good patient and, <laughs> and kind of at the same time, I found out that the mole that was removed was melanoma. And my experience with melanoma was my grandmother who had a big chunk of her arm removed and a kid that I went to school with who was a year older than me that died from melanoma. So I was freaked out. I was really, really freaked out. And I, on top of that had just moved to college and it was, you know, it's a tough, transitional time for a lot of people. So I was really very depressed. I, anytime I was alone, I would just start crying. And um, I had a very, very hard time. And luckily, they gave me all of that pain medicine. And they gave me Ambien because the pain medicine made me itchy and wired. So the two of those together, every night I would black out. And I was okay with that because I just didn't want to be thinking anymore. Um, and now, if I'm honest, my college experience didn't include a ton of drinking, just because for me that was a social thing. That was something you did with friends, and I was so depressed I didn't want to be around anybody. Um, in high school, I did a lot more drinking. In college, not as much. But over the next few years, it really didn't take long for me. I moved back to Columbus, where I was from, moved in with my parents, worked for my dad in his office, went out with my friends a lot, drank there because I had friends in Columbus. And I also had a lot of access to his pharmacy. He's also a pharmacist. And I had a lot of access to his pharmacy because I worked there. And I would just do whatever I needed to get by for that day. I'd take what I needed. I'd invent patients and dispense things to them. I was... I thought I was a doctor. It was kind of ridiculous looking back. My, my last name is Lockismo. There is a Dr. Lockismo in our family, so I guess I just adopted that persona for myself. Like, yeah, Dr. Lockismo, sure. Um, so, I mean, I wish I could tell you more about the few years between 18 and 24 when I got sober, but not much happened besides getting drunk, getting high, not even being able to work at one point, like towards the end for the last year or so, I really didn't do anything. And I don't say this at all to place blame on my family because I think that they were doing the best they knew how to do with what they had. But I had a lot of enablers in my life. And I think if somebody had pulled the plug sooner, I would have gotten sober sooner. Um, I'm grateful that I got sober when I did. 
So I got into some semi-legal trouble um, because I thought I was a doctor and because I thought nobody else understood the amount of pain I was in. I started writing prescriptions for myself. Um, makes sense, right? <laughs> like, nobody gets it. And if I tell them how much pain I'm in, they'll think that I'm a drug addict. That was my logic. And I couldn't have them thinking that. So I wrote a ton of prescriptions for myself. And it, the first time, this is so sad to me that I did this, and I'm so not this person anymore. Um, but the first time I did it, it's because I knew where my best friend got her prescriptions. I knew she had TRICARE, and I knew there were $4 each. So I pretended that I was Anna, and I wrote these prescriptions for Anna, and I'd go to pick them up. And luckily, she found out because I called to tell her it was too soon to fill it. Um, and I knew that my dad was going to find out. So I talked to him about it and I told him, honestly, I don't know why I did this and I will never do it again. And I meant it. And then I couldn't even tell you how soon after that I was doing it again. And there was no like, but I said, I won't, it just happened. And I could not tell you when and how, um, but that went on for another six months or so, and I got better at it the second time around, I'll tell you that. And I got a lot of stuff and a lot of prescriptions, a lot of refills. I had a lot of different personas and identities, and I had it all in my phone, who I was, when and where. And I was extremely paranoid. Um, it was a really rough time. And thankfully, after about another six months of that, at least, I got found out again. And... Um, I knew that my dad knew again and I went to talk to him about it again. And the only thing he said to me was, you're going to rehab. And there was no fight in me left. I mean, I was so ready for whatever it was. So I just said, okay. And I went and, um, I'll tell you my experience with rehab prior to that was my dad who had gone to Ridgeview, did three months, came back, and, you know, within a couple years was bringing vodka bottles or water bottles full of vodka with him on hikes. So I didn't think that I was required to, like, get sober or anything. I thought that I was being punished, and I really thought that everyone else was doing what I was doing, but they were doing it better. That's how twisted my, my mind was at that point. I really thought that there was no way everyone else wasn't taking as many drugs as I was. They just went to work when they did. <laughs> like, that was, I was convinced. So, um, I started at an outpatient treatment center in Columbus and didn't last too long there because I didn't get at all why I was there. Didn't really bother to show up. So they, they booted me up a level of care. I went to an outpatient in Dunwoody and lived in some residences there. And, of course, I brought drugs with me because how are you going to get through rehab without drugs? Um, so once they found that out, <laughs> I was put inpatient, and I was there for about five months, and I really needed every day of it. Um, in the big book, they reference the alcoholic who has to get sober basically before he can get sober. Like the, the guy that has to detox and then he can get it. And that was totally me. That was once I was probably about a month in, I was like, Oh yeah. Wow. My life's terrible. <laughs> what have I done? Um, and at that point I was as willing as I could be to give sobriety and recovery a try because for so long, I was the victim of my own life. I really was. I mean, all of the stuff, all of the chaos that had happened in my childhood, I used that as an excuse to self-destruct. And it, don't get me wrong, it took me a while to get out of that mode, but I was willing to give it a try. And I was willing to do some of the stuff that people said that they had done that worked for them. Um... So after I got out of treatment, I got a sponsor, and I started working steps slowly, and then I decided I didn't like that sponsor, so I got another sponsor, and then I started working some more steps, and then I did that again a couple times, and then I realized that I really needed to get serious about this, um, and so I did, and I found a different sponsor, and I worked all 12 steps with her, and I didn't 
approve of everything she was doing with her life because I was the authority on what sobriety should look like at that point, right? Um, so I got a different sponsor. But I waited until I'd finished the steps to do it because it was important to me to stick with something. Um, and since then, a lot has changed, you know? I've realized that a lot of the problems... My big thing was, you know, my family. Like, how am I supposed to deal with my family without drugs? How am I supposed to do this? Because they're terrible. Everything was their fault. And... What sobriety has given me is the gift to realize that all my problems are of my own making. And I used to to hear that and think of it as like, because I'm, I'm the bad person in this equation. I'm the one that screwed this up. And now I know that if I'm upset at what somebody else is doing, I have the power to remove myself from that situation or create good boundaries with people, things like that. And for me, that was really pivotal in early sobriety because my relationship with my family was so difficult and so threatening to my sobriety. And once I kind of figured out how to put proper distance between us and them and stopped getting so wrapped around the axle when things would happen, like I remember early on in my sobriety, my dad tried to tell me how how to do the ninth step. And it just made me so angry. Like, how are you going to tell me this? When you didn't even stay sober after treatment, what do you do? You know, and it used to just make me so angry. And I would, like, I would uh, focus on that for days and days and days and, you know, get so angry. And once I realized that I didn't have to engage and I didn't have to, you know, deal with them the way that I was used to, I guess a little Al-Anon stuff, if I'm honest, um... I was able to really focus on myself and focus on my own sobriety and not what everyone else had done to me. And so I did. And um, one of the big pieces of my sobriety has been service work. I've done a lot of it, and it's been really good for me because I have what I like to call a noisy brain. Um, There's a lot going on up here a lot of the time. I can be very analytical and very critical of myself. And it can be really difficult to shut that off. And the biggest thing that I've found that's helped me shut that off is focusing on what I can do for other people. And not always in a sobriety-related way, but very often so, because that's something that I'm passionate about. So it's easy to shut it off and listen to somebody else versus like, oh, I'll help pick up trash. I don't care about trash. Um, Just kidding, I care about trash. (laughs) So... That has been a huge thing for me, and my sponsor, who I've had for several years now, has been very big on the concept of a higher power. And I had one before with other sponsors, I guess you could say, but it wasn't really drilled into me, like, what's your problem fear? How do you fix that faith in a higher power? And it seems really trite to say it out loud like that, but it's very simple for me. And, you know, initially my higher power was like this personified being, like if I could make a list of the perfect person or the perfect parent, this is what it would be. And I prayed to my higher power and talked to my higher power. And as I've stayed sober and had more experiences, that has shifted in a way. Um... And initially that really freaked me out. Like, oh God, does this mean I'm going to relapse? Because my faith in whatever it is is changing. And I've really come to realize that it doesn't mean anything except that I've been sober for a while and my concepts in life are changing. Um, But anyways, in terms of a higher power, that has been a huge, 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 huge thing for me. Um, Just in the last year and a half, I've had two major surgeries, and for someone with my history to be able to stand here today sober through both of them is gigantic. That's, you know, if you talk to anybody in the medical community that doesn't have experience with addiction, that's, like, unheard of. Um, And I can definitely say that it's because of the fellowship, and it's because of a higher power, and it's because I really do do this thing that... 
I've been able to walk through that, and it was really rough. Don't get me wrong. Um, and there was a lot of fear and a lot of mostly just fear. <laughs> um, there was a lot of fear and a lot of pain, and both of those are 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 difficult to deal with for me at least. Um, and on top of that, I've I've had what else have I had happen? Um, I had a really um, dysfunctional relationship that I was in for a while and walked through that and ended that and was able to stay sober through that, which I know a lot of people have a difficult time with in early sobriety, especially. Um, and I've dealt with moving, <laughs> which honestly, I can list off all the chaos that went on in the first like three plus years of my sobriety and moving was the most difficult. I will not lie to you guys. If you move, if you buy a place, don't underestimate it because it sucks. It's terrible. <laughs> um, I lived with my sponsor for like two months. I only packed clothes for like two weeks because I thought it would be such a breeze. And it wasn't. It was really, really tough. And there was a lot of, like I'm used to a schedule and structure and there was none of that. And Thankfully, I had the support of the fellowship and people who care about me and a higher power and the steps and all of those things and was able to just kind of like get through it one day at a time as we do. Um, and not that I ever wanted to drink over buying a house, but it's one of those things where all these amazing things were happening in my life. I was back in school and I was you know, buying a place and I was doing really well in, in my job and everything was good. And why was I so anxious all the time? And why was I feeling all these terrible feelings? Um, and luckily now I have a solution for those terrible feelings. Whereas before I felt like if I didn't do something to fix what I'm feeling right now, I was going to feel it forever. Um, that was my big thing. I felt like I had to change the way I was feeling or else I was going to feel that way until I died. And that would be probably tomorrow because I felt so terrible. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what all else I can share with you guys. This is really short. Um, so, yeah, I got my four-year chip in January. And I will say that it's. I felt a little bit like I was graduating from high school or something. You know, like, all right, my senior year's over. What do I do with my life now? <laughs> Um, I felt almost like I did when I picked up my one year chip. Like I remember feeling this disappointment that my life was my life at that point. I thought that it would be so much different. And in the last several years, I've really grown to like the life that I have and like just simplicity and like routine and like being boring. Um, and I really like, so my recovery Maybe this is controversial. My recovery is not just about AA. There's a lot of things that I do for my recovery. I do yoga. I exercise. I hike. Part of my recovery is taking really good care of myself, taking really good care of my dog, um, friendship, all of those things. And AA is what helps me stay sober so that I can actually experience recovery in those areas of my life that are important to me. Um, and that's really all I have to share with you guys. So thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.